Hello and welcome to another edition of Illinois Lawmakers. I'm Jack Titchener along with Rich Miller, editor and publisher of the Capital Facts Newsletter. We're in the final hours of this uh, spring general assembly as the clock ticks down to Friday night at midnight. A lot of issues have moved, like the budgets are moving, but still pensions and concealed carry still hung up. Yeah, and it's tough to predict exactly how this is all going to end because we're talking Thursday afternoon. Right. Uh, I, I got to figure they'll, they'll figure something out on concealed carry, but there's just a lot of machinations going on, which is typical of an end of session. Uh, you know, I wrote this morning, the bills pop up and they die and they come back to life again. And, you just the last couple of days of a, of a legislative session are, are really, it's, it's like a roller coaster ride. It looks like, though, the Senate president and the House speaker kind of dug into their respective positions on pensions. You know, the Senate president has tried over the years, since he became Senate president, to change the tone. Because Madigan had a very bad, House Speaker Michael Madigan, a very bad working relationship with Senate President Emil Jones. So Cullerton, who was Madigan's floor leader here in the House many years ago, the godfather of Madigan's own son, is trying to tone everything down. But I think Madigan has taken advantage of that. Uh, while he still loves the guy personally, this is business. And he's really shoved a lot of things down Cullerton's throat this year. Budget, Cullerton won on the budget finally. I think because Madigan realized they were playing hardball and everything else, they had to negotiate on the budget. Is it conceivable that at the end of the day, they go home without an agreement on this? Yeah, it's always conceivable. You know, the budget will be passed, so there will be no government shutdown or anything like that. Um, it, it's conceivable. And right now what you see, though, as you said a little earlier, uh, you're seeing some last-minute jockeying for positions. The teacher's retirement system uh, analysis has been run out by the We Are One co coalition, the union coalition, saying, hey, you, the House Speaker's uh, pension bill is so severe that you could actually end up incurring Social Security liability. Well, this is based on the teacher's retirement right. system analysis. Um, they're all using the, the actuarial analysis, their own numbers. Uh, there are real problems with the bill that the speaker passed out of the house real serious problems that could end up costing taxpayers a lot more money in the future if this analysis is correct so at the end of the day whatever happens is going to be a court fight over it yeah uh, and you know there's a case to be made that the general assembly should always try to stay within the constitution um, and yet, you know, they're passing these pension reform bills that many people believe aren't constitutional. Let the courts decide. That's fine. That's their job. Let them decide this. But, you know, it's hard to see how you make that House proposal constitutional. It's really hard to see that. So, we'll, you know, we'll, but you never know what courts. They, they often they, they come to a conclusion and then come up with the reasoning afterwards. And uh, as in the case of uh, the pension bills, the speaker has dug in pretty, you know, pretty deeply on that. Yeah. We've passed that. Same thing with concealed carry. Yeah, there's room for negotiation there. And as we sit here on Thursday afternoon, I really believe that when they start smelling that end of session gavel, um, that the two sides will come together and get a bill. Sometimes, you know, it takes the clock ticking loudly to accomplish anything in this town. Tick tock, indeed. Yep. Rich Miller, thanks very much. We appreciate your time. Thanks on for Illinois having Lawmakers. Me. Up next on the program, a one on one conversation with the Speaker of the House, Michael Madigan of Chicago. House Speaker Michael Madigan, Democrat of Chicago, is our newsmaker interview on this edition of Illinois Lawmakers. Good to have you back on the program, Mr. Speaker. Nice to see you again. Good to be here. As we sit down to talk, we're a day and a half away from the scheduled adjournment on May 31st. The House and Senate still appear to be at impasse on the biggest issue of the session, and that is pension reform. In your view, what is the lay of the land? Both chambers have passed pension bills that will reduce the benefit level in public employee pensions for four state pension systems. The House bill is a very comprehensive bill. The House bill would generate far more savings to the state of Illinois than the Senate bill. So we're very hopeful that the uh, Senate will consider the House bill, pass the House bill either today or tomorrow, and uh, put Illinois in a position where we can show the nation and we can show the bond rating agencies that we've made significant pro progress 
in reducing our liabilities for public employee pensions. And that is critical at this point because we've undergone several downgrades for our bonds. Uh, the state of Illinois is a governmental unit that gets very poor ratings in terms of its finances. And a major problem is the unfunded liability of the uh, state pension systems. And so our goal in all of this is to show savings and to show that we're balancing the books of the state of Illinois. That's why I would prefer the House bill to the Senate bill. Uh, Senate President uh, John Cullerton uh, has passed a different version of the bill over there, and uh, his offers employees and retirees something he says is important to meet the constitutional mm -hmm. test, and that is consideration, a choice between the level of COLAs that they could get in retirement and, and their state insurance. He says that's critical to passing uh, a constitutional test. Well, you know, people can disagree, and clearly lawyers can disagree. And so you've got lawyers on both sides of this issue. Uh, there are lawyers who feel that the House bill meets the constitutional requirement. The ultimate decider on this will be the Illinois Supreme Court. And that's why it's really important that we move the House bill and get it over to the Supreme Court for its consideration. The Senate hasn't taken up uh, your version of the bill yet at this point as, as we sit down to talk. But they are moving on some earlier uh, separate bills that were components of the overall bill that passed out, uh, limiting cost of living adjustments, capping the salary upon which uh, you draw your pension, and then raising the retirement. Uh, some of those could save some pretty significant dollars. Yeah. Is this a way to go in the end if you can't reach agreement? Those three bills are elements of the comprehensive bill, which was a House Amendment to Senate Bill 1. And uh, again, I would say the reason we're talking about this is the fiscal condition of the state of Illinois. And the comprehensive bill would show far more savings than those individual bills. And so my judgment would be, uh, let's move forward on this issue. Let's show the bond rating agencies, let's show the nation that Illinois has the capacity and the willingness and the desire to correct its fiscal house. As state Democratic chairman and a, a longtime uh, uh, person who has dealt with labor in the state, admittedly, the Senate version, which was backed by the unions, would get a pretty good reception in the House if it were called. Uh, it's true that the Senate bill was negotiated with the unions, but, but again, this discussion would not be happening except for finances and they need to show savings on pensions. And the uh, House bill saves far more money than the Senate bill. And that's why the House bill should be sent to the governor for his signature. And then we expect that there will be a court challenge and the Illinois Supreme Court will ultimately decide if this bill is constitutional. Now, there, was, there was one approach suggested earlier to have both houses pass both and see what, see what the courts do. That's a lot of... Uh, in-house baseball in the legislature. The people of the state, the voters, are more concerned about the finances of the state of Illinois. The finances of the state of Illinois are in real trouble. And we ought to be about the business of correcting that. And a good first step would be to pass the House bill. Will you call the Senate bill over here? No, we don't plan to consider the Senate bill. The Senate bill is an agreement with labor unions. The labor unions that I worked with for over a year on this question are not in favor of significant change. There is a new concern just raised in the last day or so by a teacher's retirement uh, system analysis of what uh, your bill would do, that uh, it would end up uh, costing uh, retirees so much that they would be forced to enroll in Social Security. The Senate president says that's a huge problem for the bill. I really don't understand that point because uh, some people never enrolled in Social Security. I believe that nowadays why uh, people have that ability. Uh, but, but again, absent serious fiscal problems for the state of Illinois, absent serious fiscal problems for these Illinois pension systems, we wouldn't be talking about this. Well, as we continue to talk about this, one of the issues that you have been steadfast in for, for some time now, and the Senate President agrees with you on, is this idea of cost shifting, particularly sure. for the suburban schools and the downstate schools. You've had talks on that in recent weeks. Where are we? We're prepared to move a bill that would uh, provide that in SURS, which is the university uh, pension system, that the real employer would pick up the employee pension cost. And so today, uh, Illinois has a very strange arrangement 
where for universities, community colleges, and local school districts, the employer cost for people who do not work for the state of Illinois is picked up by the state of Illinois. And this legislation at this one system, SURS, would provide that going forward, the real employer, the universities and the community colleges, would pick up the employer share of the pension cost. What about TRS, the teacher's retirement system? We're still working on the TRS bill. Uh, we've encountered more resistance from the local school districts than we did from the universities and the community colleges. And so we're going to move forward with the university and community college bill. Um, Moving on to another issue that you have spent a lot of time on personally in this session has to do with concealed carry. Uh, you've come around uh, to a different point of view on that since the courts ruled on it. You know, the House this year has voted 20 to 25 times on the question of concealed and carry. And so we have a solid record of actual voting in the House of Representatives. And that record of voting clearly shows that there are sufficient numbers in the House to preempt local ordinances, like the city of Chicago ordinance. Right. In light of that, I got involved in working with all of the interested parties, and we drafted a bill that would provide that Illinois would join the rest of the nation and provide for conceal and carry, and at the same time preempt local ordinances. What it says is there shall be one state law not the potential of one state law plus 220 local ordinances. That's what it would say. But that kind of preemption, though, is dead on arrival over in the Senate, from what we hear. Well, uh, the Senate president, again, uh, right. taking uh, a different point of view from, from yourself, in that right. he says when it comes to things like automatic weapons bans and things like that for Cook County, Chicago, we should still be able to do that, even though we do agree on concealed carry. The real question in all of this is when a police officer is prepared to make an arrest on a gun charge, does the police officer need a state law and a local ordinance, or does he need one state law? And the answer is, if you talk to police officers, they need one law. That's what it's all about here. And so what you have with local ordinance is local politics. And so local officials do local politics, and they adopt local ordinances. They generally wind up in the court somewhere under challenge in the record of the local governments. Over time, has been a series of losses, which has resulted in certain lawyers making some pretty significant fees defending the local ordinances. Given the disparities in the two bills at this point, can you, can you beat that uh, June 9th deadline, Mr. Speaker? Well, I sure hope so. I mean, the court was pretty clear, and uh, for my part in the House, why we've taken action, and uh, we feel that we're in compliance with the court order. One of the things that normally holds us up at this time of year seems to be on a fast track to getting done, and that's a budget agreement, about a $35 billion overall general funds budget for the state of Illinois, passed by Democrats in both houses. Sure. Yeah, and I, I, uh, I regret and, and I'm disappointed that the uh, Republicans in the House did not join us in the budget making. Uh, because had the Republicans in the House joined us in the budget making rather than removing themselves from the budget making, I think we could have done a better job in the budget making to provide for the payment of old bills. Here again, we're talking about the fiscal condition of the state of Illinois. You begin with the unfunded liability of pensions and you get to the annual budget making. And so in the annual budget making, for my part, it would be very desirable if we would show progress in paying old bills, bills where people have provided a service to the state and they haven't been paid. We're severely behind in paying bills. And I regret that Republicans didn't join us because had they joined us in the budget making as they did in the last two years, Together, we could have shown more progress in Their parting bills. shot is this is $2 billion more in new state spending at a time when you've got all those old bills. Uh, they say this is basically uh, sure. insurance that the, the, the temporary income tax will have to be sure. made permanent. See, the record over the last two years is that when the Republicans joined us, we made progress on their desire. And they didn't join us this time, and I find that to be regrettable. Mr. Speaker, thanks for the time. We always appreciate it. That's all we get. <laughs> That's all we get this time. Up next, a Senate perspective on the last few hours of this session of the Illinois General Assembly.
Joining us now on Illinois Lawmakers, Senate Education Committee Chairman William <coughs> Delgados, Democrat yes. of Chicago, and the Assistant uh, Senate Republican Leader of Hinsdale, Kirk Dillard. Good to have you both with us on Illinois Lawmakers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as we wind down the session yes. here, there's still a couple of big issues hanging fire, most notably with pension reform here at the Capitol. The House has passed yes. one version, the Senate's passed another. What are we going to do in the next day and a half, Senator Delgado? Well, as you probably noticed, um, I've been adamantly uh, against major changes, if not any changes, to our pension laws when it comes to yes. promises made, promises kept. Well, this was an issue that was created by this General Assembly's, uh, and I've been in both chambers for the 15 years, and, we, and these, in, these issues are very dear to my heart when it comes to the yes. labor agreements and the constitutionality of, of making sure our benefits are in place. At the end of the day, um, we know that something has to be done, and I'm very glad that there is a coalition yes. bill uh, from Labor, and, and President Cullerton has advanced, uh, and although, as we know, it's, it's out there being uh, discussed, I, I'd like, we know that there'll be some changes, but it has to be done in a way that we don't punish our, our retirees yes. and workers. Senator Dillard, you've been watching this, uh, this issue unfold all the way back to, I believe, the Thompson administration. This should have been tackled decades ago, Jack, and it's ironic. I'm a Senate Republican yes. and I will support Speaker Madigan's plan because it's the only one big enough to solve our problems. Two-thirds of the Senate Republican caucus will probably vote for Speaker Madigan's plan. I believe the Speaker can yes. easily come over and get uh, six of Senator Delgado's colleagues. He's the chairman of the Democratic Party, the powerful Speaker. I think the Speaker needs to pick up about six of Willie's caucus and we can put this pension issue behind us. And Jack, it is the issue facing Illinois. It stifles our private economic development, and until we tackle pension reform, this state will never work again. Do you yeah. buy into his, his his breakdown on the votes? And well, on the breakdown of the votes, I mean that's a political yes. that's a process here. However, at the end of the day, uh, we have to be incremental. Uh, the package is, is very has a, is very large, and it will, we understand it will be that we expect constitutional problems with that in terms yes. of it being able to get through the system. And, and creating more pain later on. I believe President Cullerton's legislation is incremental and that this is sort of, we don't have to put a bowling ball through a keyhole here. We have to address this problem and do so in a timely manner. And I think that that, that, that yes. sets that there, in there's a, there's a There's a new approach of emerging late in the week here in the Senate whereby three House bills that earlier passed out of the House that take one step at a time toward tension, yes. pension reform may be moving forward since there's you know, it, it's difficult to say what the House bill's future would be in the Senate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and that's why we strongly believe that we must take this, like, you know, I equate it to a large pizza. You can't eat the whole thing in one gulp. Yes. And if we're going to go ahead with a large package that's going to take on in terms of creating tiers of workers or, or, or impacting our retirees that are, that, are, that are out there struggling as it is, we've got to keep in mind, their, and their pensions are in the third with $30,000, $25,000. These aren't exorbitant yes. the pensions that these particular workers are getting. Senator Dillard, can it be done piecemeal? It shouldn't be done piecemeal. We're six votes short, Jack, in the Senate of getting the whole thing completed, sending it to the Supreme Court to see if it's constitutional, yes. and we ought to vote on the Speaker's bill right away. There has been an agreement on the budget, albeit one that was passed by pretty much the Democrats on both sides of the aisle. It's moving forward. Uh, Senator Delgado, as a, the Education Committee Chair in the Senate, you were concerned about the potentially deep cuts that were going to be made to K-12 through and higher ed. As yes. you know, the governor proposed over $400 million cut to education, and we're very proud that we were able to restore those dollars uh, now in the Senate, and the fact that we were, were able to do yes. so. It's imperative with what's going on in our school systems, from down from Harrisburg to McHenry, and as we know what's going on in the city of Chicago in terms of schools, one of the most unprecedented moves were made yes. in having to shutter 54 schools. There's no doubt about it that, that we are on the right pace. When it comes to our workers' rights and, and the Constitution and what we've done with pensions, we need to be, uh, we have to be incremental. We can't throw the baby out of the bathwater on this one. The Republican criticism has been this is $2 billion more in spending than, than we have, and we've got all these billions of dollars in back bills. Can we afford it? And, and at this point in time, it's not, sometimes it's a matter of, of necessity. And, and according to our staff, uh, can we afford it? Uh, not necessarily say we can afford it. It's about being creative and it's a must and being able to make sure that those entitlements are there. If it's for, for single moms or Medicaid expansion, as they call it, although 
I think that that had to be some of the monies for restorations. Did that billion and a half in new unexpected tax revenue make the difference? That money should be going to, and it's a windfall temporarily. Uh, it's a blip because of the federal tax code changes, which means next year we will get less from Illinois taxpayers. It all ought to go to pay off unpaid old bills. We still have seven and a half billion of unpaid bills uh, sitting around in the halls of state government. And Jack, it ought to be used to pay down our old bills. And I know that's going to be a lot of intention of what we'll wind up having to do just based on, on our timetables of payments. Now, on the other side of that coin, though, it's, it's just very important to, to, to look at uh, a windfall. The economy, if we look at our economy, it's, I, I, I don't believe it's a blip anymore. The economy in Illinois, as it is nationally, uh, what NASDAQ and Dow is showing on the markets, uh, we are, the economies are picking up. Illinois is starting to move forward. The receipts, I believe, are very clear. And although we can factor in the blip, uh, we, I strongly believe Illinoisans are one of the most qualified workers in this nation, with a hub of America. And as we move forward with our abilities as a workforce, a labor force, uh, those receipts will continue. So, going to happen because of job growth, or are we going to have to keep that income tax permanent? We know that this blip is caused by uh, change in federal tax law, and uh, we should spend it on paying off our old bills. We shouldn't increase spending by two billion dollars uh, when we have seven and a half billion of old bills hanging around. We've just come off a round of prison clo closings. We, there have been, been talk of layoffs. In this new budget, will there be any more facilities closings? Will, they, will there be layoffs? We, you're still also going to have to pay the AFSCME pay raises that the court has ordered. And that's still on the right. That's correct. I believe that would be a, a House bill of 206 or 208, which actually needed an amendment to take them back pay to receive. That's being worked out in the background. In terms of facility closures, I'm not familiar with any uh, other ones that are, that are on the list for closures. Um, and, and I work very hard to protect uh, from, a, from a mental health standpoint as a former chair of public health to, of course, trying to run a moratorium here just to keep the schools open, uh, understanding that, that uh, we have to be reasonable. There has to, of course, be cuts in certain areas, and we have to have paid down certain debts. At the end of the day, though, public health and the lives of our citizens and human services are, are always in flux. So we have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time here. Can we do that? Um, you know, we have got to scale back state government. But there are some closures I don't agree with, like the Murray Center. That's in downstate Illinois, downstate. In, my, in, in my neighborhood. I One area where there, there seems to be some last minute movement toward uh, some agreement has to do with uh, concealed carry in the city of Chicago and the rest of the state. We've got that June 9th deadline from the federal court really hanging over us. Is, is, that, is concealed carry going to pass here at the last moment? Uh, I truly believe that the, it will. And uh, the fact that uh, it's amazing how people's minds change once the, the court order comes in, that, that's, uh, that has to be done. Now, according to uh, uh, June deadlines, as you know, for, for our, our, our viewers, um, um, is really not such a mandate deadline as to, I mean, but what if we don't make that deadline, then all municipalities can do their own thing in a home rule. But we do see some compromise coming together on that, and, and uh, we'll see where it goes. And, and uh, I'm ready to vote. It comes down to that preemption. The House bill that came over basically took away the rights of all home rural communities to have their own gun laws beyond concealed carry. We have one constitution in America and in Illinois, and you can't have a patchwork of 200 plus concealed carry laws because you turn law abiding citizens into inadvertent felons. And, you know, Jack, whether it's pensions or pistols, uh, the Democrats can't seem to uh, ever get anything in order. And I, I, although I don't agree with his last statement, I agree with the senator as to um, not having that patchwork. Having done uh, felony work in another state, has that seen uh, carry concealed years ago, and, and seeing the impact on a metropolitan city uh, like Miami, you know, although it led capitals of, of murder capitals at one point, carjackings, and, and, and the, the impact. Uh, for, for, the, for citizens to bear arms uh, did not explode in people's faces. Uh, and I believe that in Illinois, and now over 48 states, I understand, or 46 states have carried concealed. And I think that uh, I do agree there's one constitution and it should be one state. And, and at this point, that's what these sponsors are working Quick, on. Quickly, knowing how a lot of the lawmakers in the city of Chicago feel about this, I just read the Sun-Times headlines this morning, four dead, 11, 11 yes. wounded in overnight shootings I, on I, Chicago's I south side. About that and knowing how a lot of the sub suburbanites and downstaters feel about it, I'm from southern Illinois myself, uh, how, how is the issue in the, in the last few days 
uh, gotten us to this point where concealed carry will probably be the law of the land? Well, I can only speak to the, the, rep the people in my district and folks I've come in contact with the last couple of weeks. And one is actually a, a former law enforcement a ch a deputy chief of police, and then of course constituents and ministers who have actually uh, have said uh, uh, they're very supportive. Actually, uh, something has to be done, and we just have to be careful moving forward. Anything new and dangerous would have gotten. We've got to be careful. And Senator Diller to close. You know. It we need to roll up our sleeves, get pension reform passed, concealed carry we have to do by June 9th, hopefully we'll get it done in the next day and a half, uh, and then we need to make this state economically viable again for people that want to create jobs. Senator Dillard, Senator Delgado, thanks as always for your time in Illinois Lawmakers. That uh, is it for this week's edition of Illinois Lawmakers. We'll have updates posted on our website about the outcome of the spring session. Go to it at IllinoisLawmakers.org. Thanks for watching. So long from Springfield.